Hello, everyone, and welcome to Overcoming Barriers to Interdisciplinary Scientific Research in the Americas with a Data-Led Approach. This is a Times Higher Education webinar in partnership with Smith Science Fellows. My name is Alistair Lawrence. I'm the Head of Branded Content at Times Higher Education, and I'm delighted to be joined today by THE's Chief Data Officer, Duncan Ross, who will lead us through today's discussion. The final 10 minutes of the hour that we have scheduled today will be a Q&A session where attendees can have their questions answered by Duncan. So please put any questions that you have in the Zoom chat box and we will try to answer as many as possible in the time that we have. Duncan, over to you. Thank you very much, Alistair. And uh, welcome to everyone who is joining us tonight um, from a very wet and uh, rainy London. So as Alistair said, my name is Duncan Ross. I'm the Chief Data Officer here at Times Higher Education. And what I'm going to be talking through today is the work that we've been doing together with the Schmidt Science Fellows that looks at interdisciplinary science research. And I'm just going to start by playing a short video that really tries to frame uh, both the challenge and the opportunities that are associated with interdisciplinary science. The world faces incredible problems. The kinds of problems that science can answer, but they are not going to be solved by one particular discipline, looking at it through one lens. Science needs to change. When we started the fellowship program, we had an idea. If scientists could work together and across disciplines, they could make bigger discoveries faster discoveries that have a positive impact on the world. We ask our fellows to take a big risk and to pivot into a new discipline during their postdoctoral fellowship. They all come together with this sort of common mission of using their interdisciplinary science to make the world a better place. We have to be open to new questions, new ways of answering questions. That aren't possible within the confines of a single discipline encouraging young ambitious scientists to move out of their comfort zone and collaborate across disciplines. We have started to see some great scientific discoveries being formed, but more than that, a community, a community of our fellows, but also of scientists around the world who care about doing science differently to create sector-wide change. We want them to do the moonshots the things that most of the time are gonna fall flat, but that once in a while will do something extraordinary. So that was an introduction to the work of the Schmidt Science Fellows. And their program is really focused on this idea that if we can get scientists working together and get interdisciplinary science to address some of the key problems that we're facing, then we have opportunities that we wouldn't otherwise have. Interdisciplinarity is something that is critical when we think about the big problems that face the world. At Times Higher Education, we've been looking extensively, for example, at the challenges around sustainability. And there is no doubt that those challenges are ones that are often based, best addressed through interdisciplinary research. And that promise is very, very strong. We see fantastic research being done across the world using interdisciplinary approaches. But the challenges are there as well. And this is partly why we're doing this work. We want, Yes, we want to understand where people are excelling at interdisciplinary research, but we also want to understand and allow people to address some of the barriers that they may be coming across. And this is core to the, to the way that Schmidt uh, Science Fellows are working. Now, the Schmidt Science Fellowship, of course, uh, collects together some really, really bright uh, researchers, it gives them an opportunity, a supported opportunity to change their direction and work in this interdisciplinary space. But it also has challenges. The biggest and obvious, most obvious one is how do we scale that? How do we get the 
uh, 30 or 40,000 universities across the world to be more effective in their work in interdisciplinary science. So as part of that, Times Higher Education have partnered with the Schmidt Science Fellows to start the process of exploring uh, a potential interdisciplinary science ranking. And we hope that if we can do this, and we can do this effectively, we will be able to shine a light on the work that is being done, and we can encourage universities to do more and to drive progress more rapidly. What we're presenting today is the results of the preliminary analysis. And this project started back in 2021 with a series of, when we started planning a series of round tables and planning data collection, which would sit alongside the work we've done in adjusting our world university ranking methodology. To be clear, it's not part of the world university rankings. This is an analysis that sits separately but the two are inextricably linked because of the focus of the world ranking on research. Now, those round tables helped inform what we wanted to do, but sitting behind them was our theory about how rankings have evolved over the last few decades. The very first rankings that were produced, and you might argue that some rankings are still in this mode, are what I would describe as a pile of metrics. They, you start with a metric that you think has some validity. For example, uh, you may say that um, entrance qualifications might have some validity. And you just keep adding other metrics without any real thought about how those fit together or what it is you are trying to show. The second generation of rankings became more sophisticated. They started from a theory about what was being measured and what might be revealed. But they still had a challenge, which is that fundamentally they are statements of record. They describe universities or the world of higher education as it is at a point in time. But more recently, we've started to see a series of rankings such as our impact rankings, which, yes, have a coherent theory. And yes, they are designed to reflect what is happening at the moment, but they're also designed to be an incentive to improve. And that's part of the thought process that sits underneath this. If, and it is if, there are a set of metrics around interdisciplinarity that make sense in a coherent way, they could be used not just to understand what is happening now, but potentially also to encourage and support change and drive us towards greater and more effective interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research. This would fit within our series of rankings. So across the world, uh, Times Higher Education has rankings that focus on teaching. We have rankings that focus on sustainability, but we also have rankings that focus in this research space. And just to be clear, the data that we're talking about in this particular webinar is very much in that research space. There are other ways to explore interdisciplinarity, of course. We could look at its effects, particularly with regards to sustainability, how interdisciplinary research was resulting in real change in the world. Or we could look at how interdisciplinary uh, teaching takes place. And that's a particular, um, particularly interesting topic. If you read uh, our magazine, you will see that there was an article on that yesterday, looking at the teaching of interdisciplinary, or sorry, looking at interdisciplinary teaching within the US system. But what we're doing today is focusing on that research, that key research element. And how did we come to some of the ideas we have about the things we might measure? Well, we started off in 2021, at the end of 2021, discussing with Schmidt Science Fellows about the approach. And from there, we launched a series of round tables that we held at our Innovation and Impact Summit in Stockholm. Uh, we took to the European University Summit in Barcelona, the Asian University Summit in HE Japan, the Schmidt Science Fellows Global Meeting in Boston in the USA, and we also had virtual meetings with the, uh, across June. And we got a fairly consistent set of uh, descriptions of the challenges around interdisciplinarity out of those meetings. The kind of things that people were saying were important or challenging 
were uh, really broke down into a number of areas. Obviously, one of the questions is, do you have appropriate facilities? Is there a place where people can effectively meet, can foster that culture of interdisciplinarity? But there was also some interesting um, focus on the challenges around funding. Is it easy or straightforward to receive funding? And associated with that, how do you deal with the administrative overhead that is associated with working across disciplines? Often that scales almost uh, exponentially uh, by the number of disciplines involved. And another great question that was raised, and we will come back to this, is the challenge around reward and recognition. Often people felt that interdisciplinary researchers were at a disadvantage, particularly where you have tenure systems. So these were the kind of issues that were raised across the uh, round tables. Our task then was to take these issues and fit them into a coherent methodology or a coherent way of thinking about how to drive more effective um, interdisciplinary science. And the approach we've taken is to think of the research life cycle in essentially three broad phases. The starting phase is looking at inputs to that, uh, to that life cycle. Inputs can include funding that's available, both direct funding and funding from industry. It also looks at how universities actively recruit for interdisciplinary projects. We then look at the process itself, asking questions such as, do universities have a way of understanding how successful they are being at delivering on interdisciplinarity? Are there facilities to support the process? Admin support? Is promotion available? And importantly, do scientists, do researchers feel that they are encouraged, enabled, and rewarded for the work they do? But of course, we're also interested in the outputs. The outputs can include quality measures, and we will look in a little while at some of the bibliometric approaches we're taking, but also more um, subjective measures. Do people think that particular universities are doing a good job of delivering on interdisciplinarity? Now, of course, we are a, an organization who are going to be limited by where we can gather data from. And particularly when we look at challenges across the world, we have to understand that we need to be able to collect data that we can reasonably expect universities to be able to provide wherever they are based across the world. And we have three mechanisms for gaining data to provide insight. The first one is through our data collection portal. And there we can collect two kinds of data. The kind of data we normally collect for the World University Ranking is very much quantitative data. So data where it is straightforward, or at least reasonably straightforward, to assign a number to a problem. For example, um, how much research funding do you have that is focused on interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary research? But of course, quantitative data doesn't tell us the whole picture. And some of the questions that were raised in the roundtables certainly require us to think slightly differently. And for those elements, we have taken a semi-qualitative approach. So we have asked questions. We've also asked universities to provide evidence of what they are doing. And we have given an additional credit where that evidence is in the public domain. Now, that's a very similar approach to the one we have taken in the impact rankings, but it does mean that we can start to look at these uh, aspects of interdisciplinary science where the evidence may not be clearly numeric in nature. Now, alongside the data that we're collecting directly from universities, we also run a survey. In fact, we run two different surveys. One is what, one is one that looks at the general reputation of an institution for interdisciplinarity. But the second one is one that is institution specific, where we actually want to find out from academics whether they believe that they are being supported in their interdisciplinary research, whether they feel encouraged, uh, whether they feel rewarded, and so on. Our final potential data source then is bibliometrics. Gathering data on 
the research outputs. And there we can look at a number of different measures. We can look at the number of publications, for example, the proportion of a university's output that is focused on interdisciplinary science, which is an interesting measure of the intensity uh, of interdisciplinarity. We can look at things like out of field citations. Now, this is a very interesting approach. It says that a, a research publication is inherently interdisciplinary if it gets citations from other disciplines as well. And also we can look at more conventional measures of interdisciplinary science publication quality, things like field weighted citation impact and so on. So let's explore some of the responses we gave during this uh, assessment year. Well, 1,169 institutions submitted at least some uh, data. And of that, in terms of the quantitative data, we had 629 institutions who provided non-null data. Now, of those institutions, not all universities were able to answer every single question. So for example, we can see that when it came to research income dedicated to interdisciplinary science, almost 17% of universities weren't able to or couldn't uh, provide that data to us. But it still gives us a fairly good base from which to build our initial analysis. When we come on to the qualitative data, uh, 761 institutions submitted, so they pressed the submit button, button, and 710 of those said yes to at least one of the questions. Um, but here we also had situations where we had a, a bit of a variety in terms of the ability of universities to provide insight into what they were doing. So for example, if we look at uh, the question which asks about whether or not you support, you have uh, mechanisms in place to support uh, the promotion of people who work in interdiscipline, uh, interdisciplinary science, 270 of those universities, 38% said no, that they didn't have a, a method of doing that. Now, when it came to the survey analysis, uh, we ran a general survey, and this was separate from the, uh, the normal survey we do for the world university rankings. We ran this separately because we wanted to have a specific focus on science, interdisciplinary science, and we had 14,335 respondents from across the world. They were able to vote for more than one institution, so as a result, we ended up with 30,633 votes and 3,637 institutions received at least one, uh, one vote there. So the general survey was quite successful. However, uh, when it came to trying to identify responses from individual institutions, because remember, that's something that's quite important to us, only 24 universities, 24 institutions had more than 50 responders from that institution. So as you can see, that puts us in a challenging position. In reality, that data is not at this stage uh, particularly useful for further analysis, because if we don't have more responders per institution, that means that it's very difficult to validate or trust that data. That is something, however, that we still feel is valuable. And as the project goes forward um, and we have more focus on the universities that are submitting data, we're going to work to see if we can extend that and reincorporate that with any work we do in the future. Now, in terms of bibliometrics, uh, we took a slightly different approach than we normally do. Our long-standing bibliometric partner is, of course, Elsevier, and we work with them very closely on the World University Rankings, the Impact Rankings, and all of our other rankings. However, when we started this project, um, the interdisciplinary work that Elsevier had in place at that point in time wasn't quite what we needed for this project. So instead we chose to use Open Alex. Now, of course, um, Elsevier continued to develop Scopus and it is quite possible that in the future we will be able to move back to them. But in the short term, Open Alex provided a useful alternative to us. Now, for those of you who don't know the difference between Open Alex and Scopus, um, they are both bibliometric databases, but the biggest single difference is that uh, Elsevier is a curated database. So Elsevier have an independent panel whose job it is to ensure that only high quality research is available within the Scopus data set. Open Alex, on the other hand, has a searched approach. So they search for research and they don't really have a quality filter there. Um, 
There are some other differences, which I will be happy to go into later on, but this is where we are at the moment. Now, within the Open Alex snapshot that we have used, uh, there are 47 million relevant science publications between 2018 and 2022. And we're looking at the five publication types that we look at in other rankings as well. Now, one of the interesting things about the way that Open Alex assigns a uh, subject to a publication is that a single publication can be relevant in more than one subject uh, from the perspective of Open Alex. And so you can see that although we have 41 million publications, there are 399 million, so almost tenfold number of subject tags there. This gives us a very rich data set to work with. And in fact, it allows us to do some interesting mathematics in terms of identifying publications that are truly interdisciplinary. So within Open Annex, every publication is tagged with a set of subjects and relevance scores. So for example, here uh, we have a publication that has uh, a relevance of 0.3 for computer science and a relevance of 0.7 for biology. And this allows us to really start to explore that uh, space of interdisciplinarity. That in itself is quite important because not all interdisciplinary research is as interesting. You have subjects that are inherently very close together. So, for example, you might well say that uh, astrophysics and physics are very closely related. They're not quite the same subject, but they are, they are very closely related. Whereas you might say that astrophysics and biology are more distant. Um, this allows us to understand that distance as well. So get a feeling and a measure for how uh, far that interdisciplinarity stretches. Now, essentially what we've done then is we've um, used the entire data set to create a frequency and create a distance between different subjects. And we have then used that to score each document. And we've taken the top 25% of all documents based on this interdisciplinarity score. And we've said that these are the papers that are truly interdisciplinary for the sake of this particular piece of research. And let's look at what that means in practice. Or let's look at some of the data that comes out of this, because um, what I've been talking about so far is the thought process that gone into this, the data collecting. But what does the data tell us? The first thing it tells us is something I think that reflects um, a growing change in the nature of research. So in terms of the number of universities that have provided data for some of our core input data, and here we're looking in particular at data that's submitted by the university, data around um, the proportion of adverts that mention interdisciplinary research, and the proportion of universities who were able to provide information on research income associated with interdisciplinarity. And bear in mind, these are raw numbers of universities, they're not a proportion of universities. But we can see that actually uh, Asian universities are amongst the top, uh, or, or Asian countries are amongst the top countries in terms of the number of universities who have provided data. Now, again, that doesn't mean that they've necessarily performed especially strongly in terms of these measures, but it does indicate that there is a certain geographical bias towards uh, a willingness to collect data and provide data around interdisciplinarity. Now, when we look at the number of ads per uh, member of staff, and here I'm using box and whisker plots. So um, a box and whisker plot, essentially the first thing we look at is the median value, which is the line in the middle of the box. The box represents the middle 50% of the distribution and the whiskers represent the lowest and highest scoring uh, universities. So in terms of the uh, number of ISR ads per member of staff, so this is normalized to take account of the size of the universities. Uh, firstly, um, we can see that it is, again, universities in blue, which are universities from Asia seem to be doing uh, fairly well here. The USA is on there, um, although it's clear that uh, the number of interdisciplinary science research adverts that are being put out or that universities are able to report on in the US uh, in the US is significantly lower than in many other countries. And we might want to think a little bit about why that is the case. Um, there could be a number of different reasons. One could simply be that actually it is difficult for 
uh, US universities to measure that. It's not necessarily something they have measured before. But it could also reflect the strong, very strong tenure system we see within the US system. When we look at the proportion of research income dedicated to interdisciplinary science, uh, we see a more mixed picture. Again, we see some interesting outliers there. Egyptian universities performing very strongly. Uh, Saudi Arabia is, is an interesting one to note here as well. It's a, it's a country that is investing significantly in its higher education system, particularly in the research arms, uni, uh, arms universities such as uh, KAUST, the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, is leading the way there. And I think this is another interesting feature that comes out of this research, which is that there does seem to be a tendency for universities that are younger or in systems that are younger to be more adept at driving towards interdisciplinary science. It's not impossible for other countries to do that or for universities from other countries to do that, but it can be more challenging when you have pre-existing structures that um, really push people towards single discipline research. And when we look at some of the uh, evidentiary data, we see even this even more clearly. So here we have um, four examples of uh, the evidence-based questions that we ask. And just to remind you, the way this works is we ask the university the question. So for example, do you provide physical facilities for interdisciplinary science research? What we then do is we ask the university to provide evidence that they do that. So, for example, they may provide um, a link to a website where you have the, the Duncan Ross Interdisciplinary Science Building, for example. And if anyone wants to build that, I would be happy to give my name to it. Um, so we ask for evidence. We look at that evidence. If our assessors agree that the evidence is genuinely what the university says it is, we mark that as specific. And if there is some doubt of that evidence, it looks like it, it's heading in the right direction, but it's not easy to be sure, then we may mark it as gen generic. Otherwise, we would say it isn't re relevant. So when we come to um, asking about physical facilities, only about 50% of universities who uh, respond are able to provide evidence of that uh, shared physical facility. So with uh, about a third, they're providing clear, specific evidence that that's something they do. And that gets even more challenging when we ask about the ability for universities to measure interdisciplinary research success. There, only 11% of universities were able to provide a clear evidence that they are measuring or able to measure that research. So uh, that's an area where we would strongly recommend universities focus. You know, why, uh, if you're looking at interdisciplinarity, if you acknowledge that this is something that is slightly different than regular research, what are you putting in place to ensure that you can measure that effectively? Around administrative support. So are people providing or are universities providing additional administrative support for interdisciplinary science? Slightly more positive than the measures of success. 19% uh, providing clear evidence, 14% providing some evidence there, but still 67% of universities who either don't provide the support or aren't able to evidence it. And then finally, when it comes to uh, ensuring that interdisciplinary researchers can be assessed fairly in terms of tenure and promotion, the numbers are even lower. Now, some of this could be because there are some systems which are less tenure focused, and it is possible that there are universities who, who think actually there isn't a challenge here, that this is something that should automatically be in place. From the round tables that we held, it appears that that may not genu genuinely be the case, and actually there is a case for putting in place processes or procedures that ensure that people working across multiple disciplines are fairly assessed when it comes to promotion. And some of the stories we heard back from that, for example, ensuring that you have people from multiple subjects in the room when those decisions are being taken so that you're not relying on someone uh, without the disciplinary awareness of what the work really means. 
Now, when it comes to uh, the number of universities who are providing that data by country, so to give you some ideas of what's going on here, uh, I should say here, by the way, where it says IPN, it's actually a typo, which is, of course, Japan, JPN. Um, here, it clearly, we can see that India is a standout participant here, that Indian universities, and I think this is particularly the younger Indian universities, are doing a lot of work around ensuring that they are measuring these aspects. Um, and the, the space for the United States is uh, actually relatively strong in terms of measuring success, which is good to see. It's OK in terms of admin support and providing physical facilities, um, but not nearly as good in terms of tenure and promotion. And that, again, fits in with that anecdotal evidence we had from the roundtables, where particularly in the US, this seems to be a challenge. Canadian universities, on the other hand, uh, have a stronger story to tell there about the ability to ensure that promotion is treated fairly. Now, um, it's all very well ensuring those things are in place, but what about the quality of research that comes out of interdisciplinarity? And here um, I've got a couple of charts which so, show slightly different things. So it is important that I explain these as clearly as I can. Um, the first chart looks at uh, essentially what I would describe as the intensity or the focus of university, the proportion of their research, which is interdisciplinary, um, against a measure of quality of that research. Now, in terms of quality, the measure we're using here is based on a a calculation called field weighted citation impact. This is a calculation which is a so-called snowball metric. It's an openly published approach, but essentially what it's trying to do is compare like for like publications. So you want to only compare the number of citations with similar publications. It creates a ratio of your publication to a group of similar publications. And clearly if it's above one, then it's above average. If it's below one, it's below average. The goal of that approach is to ensure we can have a fair comparison across very different subjects and very different styles of publication. Now, traditionally at THE, we have used a measure of FWCI based on the average FWCI per institution or per country. There is a real challenge with that, though, which is that when you use a mean average, you are biased by the small number of publications which have a very high field weighted citation impact. And it's interesting to say that often those are uh, cross-disciplinary or multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary publications. So in order to avoid that problem, instead of using the mean value, we use the 75th percentile. Again, a good question is why don't we use the median value? The answer is that all too often publications unfortunately get zero citations and that means that we can't really use the, the median all too often, we will hit that value. So instead we're using the 75th percentile as a measure of quality. You can think of that as a measure of typical quality though. It's not identifying the very strongest publications, it's looking at average publication strength. So what can we see when we look at this chart? Now the size, by the way, the, the size of the bubble is indicating the, the volume of publications from different countries. So the first thing to say in terms of both the USA and Canada is that um, their, the amount of publications they produce or the, the average focus on interdisciplinary science is lower than the global average. Remember, we set that at 25%. We took the top 25% of papers as being interdisciplinary. So anything below 25% is lower than the global average. Mexico is, is just slightly above the global average. So that's great to see for them. But the USA and Canada, both slightly below that average. Um, in terms of quality, though, both the USA and Canada are performing strongly. You know, an FWCI of 1.5 means that on average, the publications are one and a half times the typical publication quality. But they aren't by any means the outstanding, uh, outstanding countries. If we look to the right of the chart, we can see that in terms of a focus on interdisciplinarity, China and India and Russia are outperforming. And some of this may be accounted for by uh, systems that come from very different academic traditions, where the uh, 
the conventional Western European and North American uh, breakdown of subjects is not followed quite in the same way that it is in uh, the UK and the US and Canada and so on. So it may be that some of that is playing a role. The quality of Chinese publications, however, is slightly but noticeably lower than those of the USA and Canada. A word of caution on that, one of the things that we have noticed in the world university rankings over the last 10 years is the rapid increase in both the number and the quality of publications coming out of China. But I also want to look at one other aspect of this chart, and it's these three countries here, Saudi Arabia, Hong Kong, and Singapore. At the moment, they're all producing far fewer publications as nations than the USA and China and Canada and the UK. But the quality of those publications and the interdisciplinary intensity are both very good. Saudi Arabia, as I explained earlier, is a country that has invested very heavily in its higher education system over the last few years. It's one of the advantages of essentially being a, um, a uh, non-democratic country, if you can say these are advantages, when the government decides to do something, it can uh, do that very rapidly and very forcefully. Singapore and Hong Kong have slightly different stories to tell. Singapore, again, their government, um, and I guess Hong Kong has this advantage as well, is that as much smaller um, governments, they are able to focus perhaps more on higher education than uh, governments elsewhere. So, for example, uh, the challenge Canada has is, of course, higher education is driven as much um, by the uh, um, the regional governments as they are by the national government. So that difference does have an impact. Now, the second chart is slightly different. And uh, those of you who are eagle-eyed will note that some of the FWCI numbers have changed a little bit. And I need to explain why that is the case. So here we're looking at average field-weighted citation impact. And this time we're looking at the number of publications by the square root of the staff number. So we're normalizing publications, the number of publications, by the number of staff in each university. Now, why square root of staff numbers? It's because the reality of uh, the reality of the world is that very few things can scale linearly. We might dream that if I add another 10 people to my team, I will increase the capacity for work uh, proportionally, but we know, in fact, we will have additional overheads and so on. So that's the square root of staff. But why are the field-weighted citation impact numbers slightly different? Well, the answer is because the population here is different. In the previous analysis, if I go back to that slide, this is based on all universities for whom we have data within Open Alex, whereas this chart is based on all universities who have provided data on their staff numbers to Times Higher Education. So it's a much smaller population. But it does still show us some interesting features. So uh, again, this time we can see that um, for the universities who have submitted data for the USA and Canada, actually the, um, the field-weighted citation impact is higher. So it does suggest that there's a degree of bias here. Universities who are involved in interdisciplinary science are more likely to provide data to an assessment of interdisciplinary science. That makes perfect sense. Um, and you can also see here that Canada is, again, being more effective in terms of the number of publications produced per member of staff. But as we saw before, Singapore and Hong Kong are exceptions here. So they are outliers, both in terms of the quality of publication that those universities are generating, but also the effectiveness in terms of the number of publications. Another group that's worth keeping an eye on are the Dutch, the Finnish, and the Belgians over here. Again, producing more publications with equal or higher quality than we see in the USA and in Canada. Asia, in contrast, uh, and this, remember, is an interesting balance to some of the earliest, earlier um, analysis we saw where Indian universities, for example, were much more likely to provide data. In terms of the quality and effectiveness, they are not necessarily there yet, but there is no doubt they are putting the effort in and putting resources in to match. So, Coming to the end of this session, I will remind you that you can ask questions. We have two questions so far, but there is still time to ask questions. 
What have Times Higher Education and Schmidt Science Fellows learned? Well, the first thing to say is that there is a very strong appetite for this kind of assessment. Um, over 1,000 universities provided some data and 700 odd universities provided a fair amount of data. And that compares very favorably, for example, to the impact rankings when they were launched in 2019, we had 580 universities providing data for that. However, the data itself is much more patchy. Most institutions aren't systematically recording their efforts. Um, and in particular, there seem to be weaknesses around understanding how recruitment is working and also understanding how appropriate recognition is taking place. In terms of research outputs, as we just saw, Hong Kong and Singapore are clearly leading the way. Um, but there is a strong focus on interdisciplinary science research in China and India as well. In contrast, traditional research hubs, the US, Canada, UK, Australia and Western Europe are not doing quite as well in this area as we might expect, although that's on average. I would say there are some, some shining examples of individual institutions in those regions who are performing very, very strongly. But broadly speaking, there is a story here, which is the more traditional um, research heavy countries and research focused countries don't necessarily demonstrate their ability to deliver on the potential of interdisciplinary science in quite the same way as some other parts of the world. So what are our next steps? Well, we have generated a report on the insights that have come out of this and the report, uh, we will be showing a QR code at the end that will take you to a, 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 uh, our website. You can download that report. We will be highlighting opportunities for improvement and talking about the areas where we think that universities and others can improve. We will continue the discussion about what are the right things to measure and what are the right ways of measuring those, because um, there is still undoubtedly a lot of work to be done there. But our hope is that we will be able to move towards a full ranking, which would be uh, produced and published in the 2024 2025 uh, timeframe. Our key recommendations from the report are fairly straightforward, I think. Firstly, we firmly believe that we need to see more dedicated policy processes around interdisciplinary science. Having physical facilities is clearly important, but equally important is administrative support and incentivizing staff correctly. One of the challenges which goes out not so much to universities themselves, but very much to the funders of universities, is to actually focus on how you can fund interdisciplinary science more effectively. So often we see that we have um, single subject funders, for example. It's very difficult to persuade a single subject funder to do interdisciplinary funding because that's not the way they work. So there does need to be a greater focus in terms of the provision of that funding and making it straightforward for people to apply that. And as, as was said in the video, actually doing that in a way that gives people the freedom to both try these things out, but also to fail without that being a blight on their career and their future prospects. And the final thing that we would have as a key recommendation, which actually ties in very close to the work we do, very closely to the work we are doing around um, the impact rankings and sustainability, is really trying to get greater visibility for the interdisciplinary research outputs that come from the global south. And we believe strongly that there are opportunities for great partnerships between global north universities and global south universities. This itself is one of the targets of SDG 17. And we think that if that is done effectively, that those partnerships can be very, very productive. But with that, I've talked for almost 45 minutes. It's getting late and dark here in the UK. We do have time for your questions. And if you'd like to download our report, please do use that QR code, which we'll leave up on the screen for a few minutes whilst we take the first questions. Alistair, we have five questions now. Let's start. Excellent. Thanks, Duncan. Well, um, two of them are quite similar, one from Simon Pratt and one from uh, Nathalie Galliano, which is... Hello, Simon. <laughs> They're both really about, um, you know, how can we 
universally across the world and across broad fields define what interdisciplinarity means? It is a really great question. There are a number of ways of thinking about this, but the key thing here is about bringing together the um, the ways of working and the knowledge base from distinct, distinct subjects and fusing those together into new knowledge. Now, it is something that we believe actually there needs to be stronger definition around, that actually that, that whole concept is by its very nature somewhat ill-defined. And one of the tasks we will be taking forward is to try and be a little bit more precise about what we mean about that. Um, some of the some of the work that we have done in the Open Alex database has helped us to think about that a little bit more closely. And, um, and of course, one of the challenges here is that by its very nature, interdisciplinary research changes over time after a certain period of time. Is it fair to say that this is interdisciplinary anymore or have the disciplines come together into a new coherent mode of thought? Um, so it's a great question. It's something we need to do more work on. Um, and we will hopefully in a series of roundtables coming up. Great, thank you, Duncan. And one from a, an anonymous attendee who's asked, when measuring field-weighted citation impact, how are retractions and purchase publications extracted from the data? So we aren't able at the moment to easily deal with that. This is one of the advantages of um, public of uh, Scopus as a database over Open Alex. Um, it gives you much more of that fine control. So, for example, in Scopus, there is the concept of a suspended journal, which allows you to deal with uh, with some of those aspects. Um, there is some of that work taking place within Open Alex, but it's um, not as consistent. Well, I don't believe it's as consistent as the work that's being done in Scopus. So in the longer term, we will be uh, talking with our friends at Elsevier to explore how the work at Scopus has progressed since we first started this project. Um, and we may well move back towards that. But it is a really great point to make. And it highlights some of the challenges around measuring bibliometrics. It's a very complex process. And a lot of it has to be done in an automated way, which inevitably results in some uh, lower quality data getting through. Great, thanks, Duncan. And another one from an anonymous attendee. How is THE, or is rather THE also collecting data on funding sponsors and how certain funding initiatives may be leading to ISR? For example, Canada has the New Frontiers Research Fund, which is only for ISR. And indeed, there are other research funds which have that clear dedication. Um, we aren't at the moment because the data sets that are available are quite patchy. In some parts of the world, particularly in the global north, they tend to be relatively good. But in other parts of the world, they are much more restricted. Um, I think it's a really interesting area to explore. And it's one that I'm certainly encouraging our editorial teams to dig into more deeply because they're able to take a more uh, qualitative, a more... Um, journalist-led approach to that kind of analysis. Uh, I think the the there is clearly a, uh, and you saw from our recommendations, there is clearly this focus on trying to make sure that the, the funding opportunities match up to the potential. And that's a tricky thing to do. It's something, again, we can push back towards um, not just the government funders, but also the philanthropic funders to make sure that they are uh, also um, directing funds appropriately to interdisciplinary research. Great, thanks. We've um, someone's um, Heather Young Leslie just asked a follow up question about the field weighted citation impact, which is regarding that and retractions. Will THE be working with Retraction Watch? I haven't come across Retraction Watch, um, although the name does sound vaguely familiar. I will certainly look into it. I think it's it's a really critical uh, critical. Uh, thing and, and when we're dealing with open Alex, of course we're in a slightly different position than when we're dealing with Elsevier uh, and Scopus so in the case of Scop uh, Scopus I think that's something I will raise directly with the Elsevier team because they manage their data set in that way uh, the approach to working with open Alex is slightly different in that we have more flexibility to decide which journals which articles to include or not to include and certainly if it is straightforward to integrate then it's it's the kind of thing I'd be interested in exploring the challenge with these things is often in the detail about how that works, but I will look into it. That's interesting. Thank you. And I think what well, maybe our final question. Oh no, I've had a couple more. Sorry. Um, so one other question is um, uh, from an anonymous attendee: 
how would this interdisciplinary indexing deal with disciplines such as anthropology, which is inherently multidisciplinary, but scholars within the subdiscipline may or may not be doing research together? So uh, essentially, if something is being um, uh, is if the output from that research is effectively identified as being relevant across multiple disciplines, so that's the way that Open Alex works, then we should pick it up. That should be picked up. Um, the but then you do raise an interesting question, which is at some point, as I said earlier, at some point where you start off having uh, subjects that are separate. And so research collaborations or research across those subjects is inherently interdisciplinary. There comes a point when they become mainstream and effectively the, effectively they are discipline in their own right, even though they may uh, lean on multiple historical di individual disciplines. So a great example for that might be computer science. Uh, it's not it's within the lifetime of some of us on the call uh, where computer science was really interdisciplinary work between aspects of engineering, aspects of mathematics, uh, aspects of um, uh, material science. And that only as time went by did that become a distinct uh, subject or a distinct discipline in its own right. So that will happen over time. Um, and as that happens, then things move on and the next subject becomes interdisciplinary so there is that to think about as well um and i think anthropology you could probably say falls into that kind of category it started off as being a blend of different approaches and is now recognized as a subject in its own right excellent thank you um another one from natalie galliano which is are you planning to use open alex also for the isr ranking or is the idea to move to scopus slash elsevier so we haven't decided that formally yet. Um, at the moment, uh, we have built this stage of the evaluation in Open Alex, and it's been an interesting journey. It's taught us, actually, it's taught us a lot about Scopus as well as we look and compare the strengths and weaknesses. Um, one of the big, let's be clear, one of the big challenges with Open Alex is how confident are we that Open Alex will be a viable proposition that will still be in existence in uh, 10 years time, we have this challenge with Microsoft Academic Graph, where we believe that with the backing of Microsoft, it would keep going. And of course, it didn't. So there is a very real challenge there. Open Alex also has some other uh, difficulties, particularly around its uh, ability to deal with affiliation. So the ability to link a particular piece of research to a specific university. And that requires, that's one of the things that about bibliometric databases, which is often not perceived by people using them. There is an awful lot of work that goes into making those connections valid and good. And Open Alex currently is more challenging in that area. Um, nevertheless, we've had a very positive experience using Open Alex. I would say that um, purely from a practical standpoint, my preference would be to have one database or another in the long run. And I would like to either use Elsevier for everything or Open Alex for everything. And at the moment, uh, we are working with Elsevier. So, Ideally, I would say from a personal perspective, I would like to move to Elsevier, but it depends on their ability to do the stuff we need to get done to deliver on the project. Excellent. Thank you, Duncan. I think that brings us to the end of our allotted time. If you have any uh, closing thoughts or final words you'd like to share. Well, um, can I say that uh, on behalf of Times Higher Education, thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your afternoon to listen to this. I hope you find the report useful. Understand, of course, that this is the starting point of this journey. It's not by any means the, the end point. Uh, we do believe um, that interdisciplinary science has huge potential. We believe very strongly that the work that the Schmidt Science Fellows do, are doing is exceptional and um, provides hope for some of these really challenging problems we face in the world. Please look at the report, please provide your feedback, and we will be running a series of round tables across the end of the year through the fall into winter, uh, which we would love you to attend if you can. So on behalf of Times Higher Education, myself, Alistair, and everyone here, thank you very much and enjoy your afternoon and evening. <laughs>